professor of law at Hidayatullah National Law University. Welcome you all to this virtual dais of the XRK lecture on World Day of Social Justice. XRK is the outreach platform of Hidayatullah National Law University to connect with the student community at the university and to the legal fraternity at large. It is a blended platform of online and offline dissemination of the interface of arts and humanities, social sciences, science and technology, and management with law. The program invites jurists, social scientists, academicians, lawyers, judges, civil servants, and NGOs. The program supports and supplement the understanding of law students and teaches on the connect between the theory and practice through the domain, domain experts in various fields. Social justice is, in, is enshrined in the preamble to the Indian constitution and thus plays an important role in the Indian constitutional sentiments. Whereas the United Nations has designated February the 20th as World Day of Social Justice. Understanding social justice in a newer context would refresh the perspective this nation's forefathers brought forth. The lecture seeks to bring forward discussions on the new coming facets of social justice whereby contributing to the upcoming shift in values and bringing together students, academicians, and jurists from various backgrounds to reflect on social justice and its relevance in the, in the digital world context. It is an honor to announce that we have amongst us, amongst us today as the chief guest, Shri Parminder Jeet Singh, sir is the executive director of IT for Change, a Bangalore-based NGO. Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Hidayatullah National Law University, and Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, sir, Registrar of Hidayatullah National Law University. A formal introduction of the dignitaries will be made shortly. With the permission of the dignitaries, I would now proceed with today's session. Thank you, sir. Professor Dr. Uday Shankar is a renowned jurist and academician. Prior to joining Hidayatullah National Law University as a professor and registrar, Sir has provided his services at the Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law at IIT Kharagpur. Sir is an expert in various fields of law, including energy and constitutional law. As the registrar of this university, Sir has been working tirelessly to improve the quality of education and research. May I now invite Professor Dr. Uday Shankar Sir to deliver the welcome address. Sir. Good evening to all of you. Uh, greetings from the Datullah National Law University, the university which is celebrating 20th year of its establishment. Social justice is a mandate prescribed under the constitution and which has been realized through several legislations. Social justice generally encompasses the principles of equity, access, participation and rights. And Digital technology is a well-proved enabler of improving accessibility, guaranteeing participation, facilitating the rights, and uh, ensuring equity to all and guaranteeing inclusivity. Today, we are fortunate to have Sri Parminder Jit Singh, who is known for his accomplishments in policy domain. Sir, on behalf of the university, we welcome you and we look forward for your talk on a very important area where you are going to speak on digital technology in the context of social justice. Uh, I also take the opportunity of welcoming our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, who has been inspiring us and who has always been encouraging us to deliver the best. Sir, thank you for joining and uh, uh, going to give an opening remark for this uh, online uh, session. I also welcome deans of the university and faculty colleagues for joining the session. Let me also have the privilege of uh, welcoming the students who have joined from universities of uh, Raipur city. There, there are students who have joined who are studying, who are pursuing their law courses in uh, different universities which are there in the city. I also welcome them on behalf of the university. Uh, and. We really look forward for a very engaging session on the on the topic on digital technology context, contextualizing social justice. Thank you, Professor Amitis. Thank you, sir. Hidayatullah National Law University has 
at its helm, a renowned academician and administrator, Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor. Professor Vivekanandan has three decades of teaching and research experience in legal education, particularly intellectual property and internet law, and has also served at National Law School Bangalore and Nalsar University of Law Hyderabad, and was also the Dean at Rajiv Gandhi School of IP Law at IIT Kharagpur and the founding Dean of the School of Law at Bennett University. At Nalsar, he has also served as the MHRD Chair Professor. At HNLU, Sir has been spearheading numerous initiatives aimed towards ensuring that Hidayatullah National Law University makes a mark in the international legal community. May I now invite Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan, Sir, to deliver the opening remarks. Sir. Thank you. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let me first... Um... A greet and invite uh, uh, Ms. Parminder, uh, whom I am acquainted and as a friend for almost a decade now. Uh, I, you know, what he, I've been following his work and attended a few of his workshops. So it was a uh, again a bit of a gap and a chance meeting in the dining hall of National Law School Bangalore about a month back, and then he was talking about how to have a coalition with HNLU, and I thought the very first opportunity we got this topic, I, I could only think of Mr. Parminder, who almost a decade now is also running part of what you call just net coalition, apart from IP for change. So I thought he's the best person at this point of time to explain the state of affairs, the internet vis a -vis people. So this topic was chosen by him, and uh, like all of you, I'm quite eager to listen to him. Coming back to this topic, to a uh, few remarks from my side. When uh, this uh, internet was uh, kind of coming uh, in a very small way in the early 90s, probably people thought, you know, this is uh, some kind of elite funny thing happening. I do remember uh, long back, uh, Lalu Prasad, the others, uh, comment, will internet give water, was a famous quote everybody used to laugh. Some thought that it is going to grow, some thought, but uh, all of us knew that the, the phenomenal way it exploded and uh, the way humongously it grew, that was one of the things. So I think uh, anybody who's, uh, if you're going to tell a, a younger person, 10 years old or even 15 years old, that internet really came of age in the early 90s, they may laugh at you and you think, how did the world exist without internet? So that is the kind of thing what internet today is. Yes, certainly from the days of dial-up mode to many things today in your mobile phone, it is there. But the issue always is about, uh, is it a kind of just a technology or what is the impact of the technology in terms of the people? We all know that uh, one of the important defining moment uh, in the um, uh, 20th century, uh, you know, discussion is about haves and have-nots. That was the defining thing. But in 21st century, we have a dif different uh, definition, no's and no-nots. So we are really talking about digital age where you know, you don't know. That becomes a defining thing again, uh, ex, uh, means, you know, kind of replacing haves and have nots in a different way. So in that context, it's a very complex stuff what we're talking. Multiple issues are there, as you, as Registrar gave in the opening remark about equity, about privacy, about uh, very many things are complex. And uh, probably if you ask people, are quite happy as long as I get uninterrupted internet. And that's enough. And then probably I think world is a nice, lovely place. But is that the reality, what is happening? And uh, for example, my my own um, involvement in ICANN, I used to wonder who, who decides, who sets the agenda, what is the narrative, all that used to be part of our discussion when it was part of at large society. Uh, what you used to call us, many times usual suspects they used to call, right? And it is globally happening even now it is uh, running around ICANN, everything. So you have a lot of questions 
as well as a lot of challenges and a lot of analysis. So I am not going to dwell because I got a person who has been doing this, you know, uh, as part of his mission, Mr. Parminder. Uh, I, I presume that he will be able to do that. With this opening remarks, I also wanted to uh, tell uh, uh, Mr. Parminder that we are almost uh, very near to launch our research, you know, uh, kind of efforts, which is called as um, uh, its hub and spoke model of research, where one of the important part is uh, is school of tech, uh, school of technology and innovation, where internet governance is going to be a very important center, and I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the center will look forward to IT IT for change as well as Mr. Parminder to collaborate as well as to understand what is happening. With this opening remark, I now uh, leave it to the anchor to carry the program. Thank you, sir. Shri Parminder Jeet Singh is presently serving as Executive Director at IT for Change. His areas of work include ICTs for development, internet governance, e-governance, and digital economy. Sir has been a special advisor to the chair of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum from 2008 till 2012. He was a part of United Nations working groups on Internet Governance Forum improvement and on enhanced cooperation and in, in, in international internet policy issues. Sir was first elected coordinator of the premier global internet governance civil society group internet governance caucus. He is a founding member of JustNet Coalition and Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. He was associated with the group that helped develop India's draft e-commerce policy. Apart from his social work and policy making accolades, Sir is also a staunch researcher in the said fields and has contributed his work in form of academic writings at major Indian dailies and leading journals. May I now invite to this virtual dais Shri Parminder Jeet Singh Sir to deliver the lecture on topic of digital age context of social justice, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Amitesh. Uh, thank you, Vivekanand, who, as he said, uh, I have had uh, the pleasure to know for a long time uh, during our um, work in internet governance. And uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, talking uh, to this premier uh, law uh, college institute. And uh, let me start uh, on uh, my topic. Uh, and as probably it's programmed, I'm happy to answer questions in the end. Now, talking about the digital age context of social justice. So there are two things here, the digital and social justice. The problem, or the good thing, I don't know with digital, is that it's so empowering that once digital is on one side, the other side becomes like, just loses its shine actually you know so when i talk about digital and social justice people's mind are full of the digital whatever they think about digital they know about digital and Vivekanand was saying give me the internet and that's a good part of my world but what i'm trying to talk today is much older much more important social justice and i'm trying, going to talk about social justice more than digital and see what happens to social justice in the current era, which is begun to be called as digital age. So bear with me. I'm not going to talk about gizmos and I'm not going to talk about all the wonderful things as such. I'm going to talk about what happens to people in groups in this new setting and how much just and fear this new system which is emerging is. And just to give you an indication, just to kind of a give you a teaser, the period of internet, uh, more or less the start of this millennium uh, to now, which looks very wonderful. And if you read the Oxford reports, it's also the period of the greatest growth of inequality. It's unthinkable growth, never in the history of humankind recorded at least. Inequality has grown so fast as this period, but how did that happen? Because wasn't internet supposed to be a great equalizer, a new communication system where everybody could talk to everybody else and opportunities were, opened up and everything was now like kind of equalized and if it was equalized why did the same period show the greatest ever growth of inequality but that is the topic we are trying to discuss today let me look at two quotations which are important uh, 
Thomas Friedman said in the 90s, there's a book, the world is flat. That's, that's the globalization era. It's, he said that now the world has gone flat. So those differences are going to just disappear and the globalization and the trade and the technology enabled by globalization is going to equalize the world. Hardly so today, the world does not look so flat. There's another quotation, William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly divided. This is a very kind of end of history and end of history is also a book by Fukuyama uh, and techno deterministic ways of looking life. Now things have been sorted out. The Western liberal democracy model has won, technology will deliver and all those political differences, the sociological confusions, the philosophical things, they are time, a thing of a past. Technology would deliver. We know the model. Everything is going to be fine. Now, that's not really happened. You look at the statistics, and I don't want to quote the statistics because they are in front of you all the time. So let's look back and see why it happened in this manner. And my uh, lecture today would be in three parts. First, I'll go and look at the historical background of from where the digital age takes birth. Second part, I would try to discuss the kind of domination and inequities which are characteristic of the digital age and what digital age is. How do you even define digital society and digital age? And the last part, which is very important to an activist like me, is what should we therefore be doing? Uh, and me, my group, uh, and Vivekananda also talked about the JustNet coalition. We are, in our humble ways, uh, part of that effort to do something. So these are the three parts uh, I'll look at. So what happened is this is the end of, uh, towards when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, for good or bad, uh, there was this new age of a singular discourse whereby it was being said, and you have heard, heard Tina, there is no alternative. Margaret Thatcher and Regan's uh, a start of neoliberal era where it was being said that state should go back, try to disappear, and the private sector should dominate globalization and later on technology was added to it, is going to conquer the world. And I already described, mentioned two quotations, the world is flat and, and uh, the future is already here, just it needs to be evenly distributed and, and then, then we have it. In the middle of it, we have the birth of this technology of internet. And one should remember that internet need not, or digital technologies need not exactly be the way they were. They were so because they were born in a certain place and in a certain political era. If let's say internet was born in Norway or a Scandinavian country, you probably would have seen a very different internet. Because the first thing, if you have to even start talking about social justice and internet, you need to be able to see alternatives to particular technological trajectory. Because unless you see possible alternatives, you can't guide it to a different possible future. Then you're just stuck to what is being told to you and then you just play along. And, and that's not uh, what a sociologist and definitely what an activist would want to do when one is interested in social justice and economic justice vis-a-vis -vis the internet because things as they stand, and that's what I started with, are not going very well. The equities, as I said, was are far rising the fastest ever. So uh, there's an excellent article by Richard Barbrook and Andy Cameron, I'll probably share it with you. The name of that article is The Californian Ideology. And they very beautifully describe how a certain techno-determinism combined the conservative right, which was against state for very different reasons, it was elitist, and a countercultural left, which was against state for very different re reasons, both claim that internet and the new technologies are the, the new deliverance. Uh, one side said that everything would be equal now and therefore it will be delivered, and other side was, of course, interested in keeping the state as far as possible. And the private sector generally took over. Uh, and what was happening now was that the post war consensus of a welfare state was getting broken. It was being superseded. There are many stories I can tell about this time, but let me describe one. There was a Republican candidate a few years back who actually said that government, before it did something, should take a Google test. If a thing can be done by Google, government need not do it. So we are talking about 
that kind of power of big tech. And when I talk about the state, and I know I'm talking to a lot of young people, and it's very, you know, fashionable, modern to dislike state, uh, which is very fine, but we should recognize, and I go back to that post-war welfare state model, or I even say consensus, that it was the welfare state which provided social justice. There's no other social justice. It doesn't hang on trees. Social justice is not something which uh, we go and find on trees. There are institutions which deliver social justice, whether it's social security, trade unions, uh, and, and all those. And these are the institutions which are largely contained or supported by a welfare state. So the role of state and social justice is very important. There is no social justice and that kind of replacement of social justice is what was meant when people said the future is here and the now internet is going to uh, deliver it uh, much more uh, you know, evenly. I'm going to come to the first part of my uh, lecture, but let me also say here that one is that technology coming from the US already was wrapped in certain kind of libertarian uh, neoliberal values, uh, which would cause problems, not immediately, because I think the first decade of this millennium passed very well and we were completely in love with the Googles and Facebooks of this world, but later on, and I'll come to what happens, also remember that in US, uh, social and economic rights are not considered as human rights. Uh, they have not, US is one of the few countries who have not signed to the covenant, UN covenant on social and economic rights. And therefore, since everything technology and digital comes from the US, apart from the other baggage I've just mentioned, one thing also came that when everybody talks about digital rights, I've met people and say, uh, who have said, uh, I work in digital rights. And I said, okay, so do you work on economic rights and social rights? No, no, I work on uh, privacy and freedom of expression, which is very well, but globally human rights include social and economic rights. But since this whole political package and baggage comes from the US, digital rights is a term which normally, mostly only means freedom of expression and privacy. And today, what I'm trying to talk to you about is social and economic rights and that's very few organizations globally work in this area and that's what we work on it's good that UN has this one day of observance of social uh, justice day on which we should also look at how this is being delivered or not being uh, delivered uh, in the in the digital age now let me go back uh, and try to figure out and try to discuss with you what is the kind of domination and inequities which uh, digital age uh, is characterized uh, with. Uh, in it 4 we look at three kinds of power. One is software power, which is the early era, late 1990s, early this millennium where Microsoft was the king. Software was eating everything. Software became big, right? Uh, this is when we call that software uh, power was huge, but the real thing was still to come and it's i mean the internet of course came in the late 1990s but it really hit the world in this millennium and when google and facebook became the big thing uh, we had this big revolution of the internet internet took over everything uh, that's when people started seeing stars we know the period of arab revolutions uh, whereby we thought that i mean Google and State Department were working together in some countries. And we saw that, you know, suddenly democracy will be everywhere because of the internet. Now, how much that has happened is it also in front of you. But there was a time when we were all seeing stars. And that's the time we say uh, was the time of internet power. It builds on software power, but we now had network software, which is called the internet. And Google and Facebook were the big things. And, and, and then, then Twitter. This is still the age of innocence. Uh, and everything was fine till perhaps uh, Snowden came along. I was a member of a UN committee at that time when we were looking at institutional options of how uh, global internet can be governed. And we were sitting in one of those meetings when the Snowden revelations came up and some of us said, our job has been done. Uh, Snowden has done it. Uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, many things happened because of the Snowden revelation. Meanwhile, people first time started to think that internet may not be that good a thing, but largely still from a privacy uh, point of view. 
It is only later when data and AI started becoming big. And that's when I say we shift to from software power to network power to now what is called digital power, which is consisting of data and AI. More or less towards the end of the first decade and the start of the second decade of the millennium, we started being hit with this phenomenon of Uber and Amazon. Initially all good, but lately uh, we have started feeling there are social justice problems. Now, probably I work in this area more than you people. I hear and read more about it. But if you really want to know about how drivers feel vis-a-vis -vis Uber or the traders and even the SMEs feel about Amazon, things are not all that great. Because what happens is that one giant platform comes. Initially, it comes in as a facilitator. It tries to help the parties which are already there. They have already taxis in the city. And Uber comes and says, I'm just going to get you additional commuters. So, so what's the problem? Everybody says that looks good. But not long after, basically, it's Uber, which is the operation. And you are just appendages to the Uber system. This Uber is the most well-known example. And what is happening is Uberification of everything. You have seen it in e-commerce now. Uh, but soon enough, it will be in every area. Agriculture, I work very closely with farmers and digitalization of agriculture and how platformization and uberification of agriculture is going to happen. In all these cases, uh, there is initially a benefit uh, given to those actors, but soon the platform becomes so overpoweringly powerful that they start squeezing the actors. Uh, I remember Uber uh, drivers, people left their jobs to take up Uber uh, driving. They were earning an Ola, of course, uh, 80,000 bucks and all, and just now get into a car with one of them. And you know what, how, how, how bad the situation is. Same uh, is happening with the traders, shopkeepers. Uh, uh, started to happen with uh, agriculture farmers, but not in a big manner because platformization still started. Uh, but we had a meeting two months back with farmers and the effect. So I'm not therefore at all trying to say that digitalization is not providing benefits. I use Ola and Uber all the time. I use Amazon Flipkart all the time. Farmers would also use the digital benefits. The point is not that digitalization does not create benefits. That's not all. The point is that the benefits are very unequally divided and soon the situation may be reached then that these small actors are actually worse off than they were. I at least know traders, uh, I'm a part of a joint action committee of traders uh, who really have big problems because many of them have to close their shops, they were earning better. And I'm there again not saying that things should not change when technology is coming. The same could be said of drivers and of farmers, but the change has to be mediated in a certain manner in which uh, social securities, uh, people's employments, social economic interests have to be kept in mind. And that's not happening when we wholesale give it up to technology to do, uh, do it all for us. Uh, I think here we need to understand uh, the phenomenon, what is happening here. Uh, I often ask people, uh, what is Uber? Uh, what kind of a corporation is Uber? And they say it's a transport corporation, but I tell them that Uber mostly does not own a car. A commuter has never met Uber guy. So how does it, uh, how is it a transport corporation when they, they, they don't have a car, they don't ever meet a commuter? Same with Amazon. Um, though they sometimes have their own goods, but they don't need to. Like Uber, they could just be that platform without ever having any goods, ever meeting a, a customer. So none of these are actually commerce companies or transport companies. They are basically intelligence companies. The role of these companies in an economy is the same as the role of brain in your body. The brain's only job is that it tells the rest of the body to do what, tells it to do what it should do because it knows better than any small part of the body better Uber knows right now that there is a cricket match which is going to happen in some part of the city. And by the time the people start coming, they already want certain number of drivers to have slept and they're ready for the shifts. It, it, it's, it acts like a brain. It knows that today, if it rains, the roads will be like this. And it already knows that festivals are coming and many people go to their native places. So the drivers are less. 
So nobody is mediating. Earlier, what happened was, and that's what Vivekanand was saying, that information generally is mediated by an organization. You receive papers and then you take decisions. Now, what is happening here is that nobody is receiving information. There is some kind of a brain out there which is just picking up data from 50,000, not 50,000, like millions of places. And like a brain, there's no intermediating human being. That brain is taking decisions about, okay, the drivers are going to be less because Shivratri is coming and therefore you do this and therefore you do this. Nobody really understands how that's happening, who is doing it. So it's taken up and this is therefore a difference between intelligence and information information is mediated by human beings intelligence is an auto executing intelligence and some of my papers which i have referred also defines digital society as that kind of a society where large scale intelligent systems relatively autonomously run different sectors if amazon's ecosystem is being run by a brain which chooses which trader to go to which logistic provider to use uh, what to do, whether to raise prices, lower prices. And somebody was telling me, and it was inside that Amazon changes prices of certain good, that good she mentioned, uh, 35 times uh, in a month. Uh, so, and nobody is doing it. Uh, there's no human being taking those decisions. So there is some, it's like a brain of a system. So these basically are brain companies. And this analogy is not something just I use. The first AI system of Google was called Brain. Uh, by those uh, city projects in Malaysia, they are called Bain. So what we are trying to see here is that uh, Uber, Amazon, etc., they collect data from us, convert that data into intelligence about us and use that intelligence then to control us. If you really look at what's happening and extrapolate it, and I'll come to the chat GPT, and I don't think more lecture at this time could be completed without mentioning chat GPT is that we are today outsourcing our intelligence. And I, I use that analogy from the industrial age. What happened at the advent of the industrial age in the last part of 18th century? A small phenomenon took place. For first time, physical power, which before that time was always either in human beings or animals. We used to plow our fields, get water out from wells. Everything was our horse carriages. Everything was done by human beings or animals. First time there was a disembodiment of physical power into machines. And that was called the invention of a machine. This was a small technical change, completely changed the society forever, socially, politically, culturally. And we had this industrial era. Just far forward, fast forward 300 years, first time intelligence is being disembodied from human beings and organizations into an auto executing system, which is capable of semi-autonomously running whole sectors. And that's what is the definition of a digital society. The problem with that is that this intelligence is largely remote and highly concentrated. And we know that there's an untapped study which says that world's top 70 platforms, not five, not 10, not 15, 70 platforms, their 90% capitalization is either in China or in US, which is more or less all of it is in either so the top 70 platforms globally are either in the us and china so all these brains i have been talking of the brains are in us and china so the physical body is in india the the logistic driver is running around the sme is making a good the trader is talking the good none of them knows what they are doing they're just mechanically doing it because somebody else is telling them because the intelligence is abroad so we outsource our intelligence it's very easy to understand we think uber but an uberification of all sectors so now the injustice is contained in this problem that okay in the industrial age what had happened we outsourced our large-scale physical manufacturing capacities uh, the factories were in in uk we produced raw material factories were there and we consumed the products that itself caused very debilitating colonization. But I keep on again giving this example, but you can still disengage from that kind of a dependency. Let's say we have been importing Mercedes cars and suddenly Mercedes cars can't come. We can still see in Mercedes cars in two, three years, probably make some bad cars ourselves, but still they will move and we can transport around ourselves. But once intelligence dependencies set in, if our intelligence, what I'm going to buy when I come back from the vacation, what are my kitchen needs? How do I make my salon appointments? How often I go to airport? 
all that intelligence is in a brain which is in the US or China, that kind of dependency is very debilitating and that's causing what you would have heard a lot about as digital colonization. So that's, that's a real danger. I'm going to uh, go fast forward, but I mean, and again, what I'm saying brain is not an analogy, I'm just using myself. Waymo, which is a Google sister uh, organization, which uh, is a transport company, says on its website, we don't make cars, we make drivers. So basically, they make the brain of the car. Uh, long back, uh, the, the CEO of Daimler, who made Mercedes, said we are afraid less of Toyotas, but more of Google and Apple, because they are going to become the brain of the car and we will become like a Foxconn is to Apple today. Foxconn is that Taiwanese company which produces the Apple uh, box, uh, phone, but the software is Apple's and Apple takes like 90% of the profit, right? So they're afraid the cars would become like that. The, the brain would be owned by Google, uh, but just the shell will be owned by us. So in that sense, the whole economy would become a shell whose brain is uh, operated there. I just wanted to make it clear that this is systemic change of economic social systems which is taking place and unless we recognize that we're not able to understand what kind of dependencies we are getting into and the last part uh, is that uh, as this is happening a very great concentration of power who owns intelligence is happening the counter power of a state is getting weakened vis a -vis at least uh, uh, big tech it may not be weakened vis a -vis the citizen but vis a -vis big tech uh, Hardly any country, even Europe, and I follow Europe very closely, they have been trying last 15 years to do something uh, to the big tech. They have tried an alternative search engine. They have been made recent laws like Digital Market Act, data, et cetera. They are not able to do much. The big European states and the European unions. So while there's a huge concentration of power happening, the counter power, which is a political power of state, vis -vis big tech is becoming very, very weak. And this is the situation in which we have what I just described of a very, very dangerous uh, situation of social injustice. And after the five or six minutes I have left, I'll briefly point out some areas uh, of work which needs to be done and which is being done uh, to correct or at least start correcting this. The first part is uh, social justice is underpinned by rights and rights are something uh, which uh, are not charity. The rights are something inherent. There is, and I think either uh, uh, Amitesh or Vivekanand talked about uh, voice and participation being a part of the thing. You have a right, and then you have voice and participation in expressing that right. So we have to develop some rights which are adequate to the digital age and its injustices uh, and how to correct them. So some work which IT for Change has been working on are data related rights. I've shared a primer on uh, uh, economic justice and data, which we did for OECD, in which we developed four kinds of data rights. First is the right uh, to benefit from one's data and not be harmed. Second is the right to access one data and to be able to port it to the third party. Third, which is not often talked about, the right to be represented in data. If you're not represented in data, you are not there. But also that includes the right to be absent from data. And the fourth is right to govern data as well, govern database systems. Uh, so make a new kind of data rights. Uh, I'm also part of Government of India uh, Committee on Data, Non-Person Data Framework, where we have come up with this idea of community data uh, and a community rights to its data. Since it is data about me uh, as an individual, but as also a collective, the data which Uber has is the data about the commuters of the city. Uh, and therefore, they should have the right, not only a privacy related right, and there's the big change, also the right to the economic value of data. Because if you really look at Uber, Uber's 80% of its value is the data based intelligence which it has. As I was describing, basically, they are brain companies. That's their main um, stock in trade. If that's their main stock in trade, it has all arisen from the data of the commuter and the car driver. And therefore, these people should have certain rights to the data and therefore they should have a right to the economic value of the data. Uh, so there are the data subject and also a data worker and we have conceptualized it in the primer, please go through it. 
your law students and your law faculty and there's some very important initial ideas of a new era what kind of uh, there's some pointers to what kind of a new rights based framework can underpin it in many ways the rights based framework of an industrial era is not adequate uh, to our times and that, that's what uh, our uh, paper has uh, tried to do so uh, these rights can actually be used and we have given example i was at an ilo uh, giving a keynote speech uh, three four years back and there we actually proposed that since uber driver are the ones who create all the data which is then going to uber and uber actually wants to say that uber driver are not even my employees i said that's very fine if they are not your employees they are uh, contract workers then the only contract between you two has been that you will give him a commuter and he'll give you a fees for that that has been done what about the value economic value of the data you collected uh, from the car driver and therefore they have collectively as all car drivers let's say of delhi have a right to the value which has been risen out of that data which is intelligence with uber and therefore we have even conceptualized that platform corporation should be a new kind of uh, an entity altogether because it actually sits on a capital which is a collaborative capital is a shared capital is produced by the entities which are subject to that capital's control so we have given this conception of a new kind of platform corporation and how therefore it could be co-owned and there is a lot of work uh, going on on that the last thing uh, is also uh, india uh, right now has g20 presidency i am on a task force of the think tank 20 the task force on digital public infrastructures one of the main reasons that big tech is in that place that it is is that in the industrial era there was a distinction between infrastructure and normal business activity infrastructure was roads and ports even banking electricity these were infrastructures and largely they were government public owned or utilities because they have to be equally accessible to everyone if somebody dominated the infrastructure Obviously, they will dominate that sector. I mean, you know that old story of a minor uh, mining town. And if somebody makes a railway line to the mining town and says, I'm only going to use that uh, railway line, that's not tenable. And governments came in and either said, we will make it public or you have to share it uh, on an equal basis as a utility. So what's happened in the digital era is that big tech has completely dominated end to end every sector, including the infrastructures part. And one of the big ways to start making things more equitable and ensure social justice is to recreate the publicness of the infrastructure part. And therefore, there is this concept called digital public infrastructures. Uh, it starts from Aadhaar, which is quite controversial, but UPI and ONDC, which is Online Network for Digital Commerce, which is actually the only thing globally an effort uh, to uh, to take on Amazons of this world. There's an open protocol like UPI for e-commerce and it's piloting in five or six countries. It's really big. Uh, so this is an effort to claim the infrastructure layer of the digital economy stack, if you say, uh, as a public system. So these are the kind of uh, things uh, being done. Uh, and uh, the last uh, two or three minutes, which I have, I will, uh, use uh, to describe at the global level there's a uh, india for example has taken a stance at the global level that it would not want what has been called a free flow of data uh, across the globe because it thinks that that's extractive practice uh, and we should undertake digital industrialization just today india shared a paper at the wto uh, which says that we should uh, undertake digital industrialization by using digital public infrastructures uh, and uh, not uh, support uh, uninhibited uh, global flow of data, which is precisely what I was describing, that data gets extracted from our countries and then goes to those two brains, uh, two places where all the brains are, mostly in the US, but some in the China. Uh, and, and we would want to have our local brains. And the only way to go forward is to therefore have uh, more federated systems, uh, more federated intelligence, uh, and uh, legal systems around it. Uh, EU has been doing a lot of work. There is a very good uh, Digital Markets Act 
uh, there's a data act. I don't have time to describe them, but there are some efforts to make the system uh, more equitable. Uh, and India is also trying to plan uh, some kind of economic legislation uh, around data. But finally, uh, and I think what has been working on community data that since it's our data, we should have an economic stake on it. But finally, we are also going to work towards uh, community intelligence uh, and say that it is intelligence about us and therefore uh, there has to be stake in it. And I would end by mentioning chat GPT. Uh, most people find it both very fascinating and scary, which is obvious, but I tell people that you may not be so scared of it. You really need to be scared of what's coming because this chat GPT, which you see is like a two year old child, which is just learning the language, it's babbling in front of you. What happens in five years when it becomes a teenager and then in five years it becomes an adult. If this two year old child can do what it's doing and you probably know that it's passed a medium level law examination in the US and also a medium level uh, medical examination there. Uh, so the question then is, can we keep on banning its application, which is not going to happen? Then you just look at chat GPT. How did chat GPT become uh, so intelligent? It's again, the same example as Uber. Uh, probably you know, what does chat GPT do? Chat GPT simply goes and divorce all the publicly available text. It just eats up. It eats up Wikipedia. It opens up books. It's just all the time eating up text. And when you really see that somebody who's eaten up that much text, it's not very difficult to predict a sentence because it has got trillions and trillions examples of these two words are followed with that word. And that's all the intelligence which you get, which is so fascinating. But going back, that intelligence came from a common product, which is publicly available text, which it ingested. Uh, so. All those old IP based formulations, et cetera, and I'm coming to those legal parts are no longer tenable because probably it's, it will come under fair use the way they have uh, taken up that text. So what is it which makes us now claim it as kind of a community asset, which is what it actually took and now is throwing it back to us. So these are the kind of formulations of community intelligence. That's where I end, which would meet the challenges of chat GPT and it's just a start. And so these are the kind of equations of social justice in the digital age. It's a huge subject. IT for change is just now nibbling at the peripheries of it, but I thought I would try to run through that area and try to give you some ideas of uh, what kind of work gets done. And I'll stop here, Amitesh. Thank you, sir, for an engaging and enlightening lecture. With your permission, sir, we may now open the floor for questions. The attendees may send in their questions via chat. And sir, by the time we are waiting for attendees to send their questions via chat, I have so one question. So, sir, we at times witness that ease of transmitting information may also lead to fake news being spread. So this may further lead to deepening of the social divides. So how can these issue of fake news be tackled so as to ensure a level playing field and to ensure a better delivery of social justice to everyone. See, fake news is one example. What has happened, and I was describing, uh, in every era and epoch, institutions get built based on certain uh, ethical principles and certain characteristics of that era. So based on the industrial method of creating and disseminating news, we had these institutions of journalism and newscasting and newspapers, and you really look at it, it's a very well developed institutions. So in those institutions were the checks against fake news, against political you know, problems kind of be easy, but suddenly internet comes and changes the uh, boundary conditions. The only way to therefore get back those issues of social justice is to develop institutions which are adequate to the current situation. So first of all, to recognize that institutions deliver justice. Institutions are based on certain ethical principles which become rights. And recognize that in the industrial age, 
these were the ways, for example, the sector you are talking about, information dissemination, information production. This was a sector in which information was being produced depending on the technologies available in this manner. And therefore, these institutions of an editor, a newspaper, a press council, a press law, all those institutions got built. They have now completely been disassembled because of new technical conditions that should be met by new institutional uh, requirements. And this has to be done quickly. And that has to be underpinned by certain basic rights uh, and ethical principles. For example, in information, we have been talking about uh, who actually the data which uh, now there is a lot of talk about google and facebook has to share some of the revenues with publishers which i don't think is adequate i'll stop here but if you really look at where all that value came from and you have a different way of distributing both value and co-ownership uh, of those who use that information as facebook does etc but to cut the long point short is that you have to develop new institutions uh, and there's no two ways about that thank you sir Sir, uh, another question would be, sir, without the concept of globalization in the digital age, would affect the state's influence on ensuring social justice or the state's duty to ensure social justice? It absolutely would. Uh, see, everything is a trade-off. Globalization gives us benefits, but politics in the state also gives us safeties, right? We have to take the trade-off. At some point, we do not need to aspire to the best, newest thing which New York produces today. Societies always have taken trade-offs. And one of the trade-offs is that we have to survive as a political community, political unit. And a political unit has to have certain territorial configurations. We are all for globalization, but the but the trade-off between uh, an unfettered globalization where the political community loses all power, for example, the way elections can... I mean, Facebook knows the election results before the elections are done. They know the genes you are going to buy. What are you talking about election results? So it's, it's a very small thing to know election results. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a joke to know what kind of election results are expected because they actually know the behavior of people tomorrow. So now in these conditions, we have to reclaim our political agency. And the political agency actually goes to the question you are saying. We have to sit down and say, OK, we will do our trade-offs. So free flow of data is a kind of trade-off. Uh, nobody is saying that data completely stops, but certain kind of local ownership. For example, IT for Change has come with this proposal that can we have a new legal formulation where the primary jurisdiction on data is not of the country where the data physically is present, but is of the country where the data originates. So wherever the data goes, but the country of origination has the primary jurisdiction. So I'm just giving you an example of new kind of formulations, new kind of institutions, but definitely globalization could make us lose our political agency, which is hugely problematic. Sir, we have received one question, one more question. So, sir, artificial intelligence like chat GPT being an effective method is challenging the work of journalism and free, freelance writing. So, what will the consequence of this artificial intelligence culture on the job sector of Indian freelance writing? And is banning these applications a right approach to tackle the problem? So, first of all, the bad news is that it's not only affecting journalists, but also lawyers. Uh, for the people who are assembled here. Uh, and in some ways, even more lawyers than journalists, because in some ways, lawyers' language is very technical. It's much, I mean, I think I always say the law is the most technical part of the social system, right? Uh, and when it's highly technical, it's easier for in artificial intelligence to make uh, deeds uh, for tenancy rights and do many things which they are actually doing, right? So this is uh, this apart. I think it's not banning. But as I was saying, the political agency is important. A society would decide what is okay and what is not okay. We do it all the time with our kids' education, with our health systems. We have to do with this also, not banning. And if we do it in a proper manner, then we change our methods like internet. Earlier, every time we had to write a paper, we had to go to a library and do many things and write a paper. It was a difficult thing. Now we can just open Google 
And much of what we do used to do is already there in the Google. Then we change the way we write, right? Then the journalists would have access to those things. Will change the way uh, if it's just uh, reporting, uh, you know, the yesterday's cricket score. It's an automatic process. You don't have to need a journalist for that, right? So that's okay. You you don't have to have a person who actually notes down. Why why not? It automatically goes to your phone. That's different from other things. So we have to rearrange things, and that's what institutions are. Uh, but these. Decisions get only taken, and I'm coming back to the political agency, a community, a small town, a resident welfare association, a country. We need to have the political agency to be able to do those things. Uh, otherwise, we can't ban them, of course, because they are very good tools. Uh, we use them. And some part of the journalism will change. Some part of legal profession will change. Uh, but we should be able to control them as, uh, as a political unit. So the previous question by asked by Mr. Mayank Kumar. So we have one more question, and this is the last question I think that we can take considering the limits of time that we have put on ourselves. So, so the last question is asked by Mr. Harsh Bhardwaj. So he has asked, uh, so sir, whether use of a uh, blockchain, let's say in finance, uh, brings in a question of transparency versus privacy. Similarly, the same question, uh, use of artificial intelligence poses on us. So how do we determine the dividing line between transparency and privacy? See, again, we do it all the time with all elements of life. So we just need to know that society collectively has made certain decisions and certain decisions are private. So we'll have to configure some decisions. All cannot be private. Some will be decided. Uh, and some would be left to private. Those those balances have to be decided. But the problem with the digital is that it very quickly gives you some very shining objects. Its allurements are huge. And don't run after the allurements because the long-term requirements of society are also important. The, we have to learn what has been called as gratification postponement. Sometimes when we face with such kind of allurements and sit back and decide. Uh, blockchain in finance is important, but really and of course you're talking about crypto we have to also ask the question are you missing anything in uh, finance which you want the crypto for or you just want the crypto because the, everybody wants crypto i actually personally am not missing anything in finance especially with my upi in my phone so what is the problem you are uh, really you know trying to solve there then probably a problem some people are trying to solve the problem with cryptocurrency is to dispense with the state power which is holds over monetary power which is one what one half of its power which could be problematic. So look at it in that manner. Probably you want to dispense with it. It's fine. But I think just give it depth uh, and, you know, take a longer term view when so much of technology is hitting us from all, all the sides. I can go into the privacy transparency part, but I think that's where I'll stop. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this enlightening session on digital age context of social justice. Uh, now, sir, I'd want to request Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Hidayatullah National Law University, to give the concluding remarks, sir. Thank you very much. And um, so it has been a short time, but uh, Mr. Parminder could uh, really uh, put a tapestry of what is happening. So the question is about uh, about the state which we know, and with the era of technology, we've got something called the deep state, right? And the question sometimes with all your love hate relationship with the state, a deep state is something which we don't really know what is happening. In such case, the fallback is in a way what is said about various institutions in the state to look at it. And as in my opening remarks, as I said that um, uh, who decides things and who's narrative in that context, he, 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 he very clearly explained about uh, uh, the from the from the industrial age to the technological age, things have become more complex in terms of who runs the show or what they run the show and what voice we have. And end of the day, social justice is all about that. As I often my favorite quote is, "Why is a central question for science? How is a central question for technology?" I do believe. For whom is the question for law? So it is very, very essential at this point when he said that uh, law schools, lawyers, and uh, 
people are thinking how to play a predominant role in terms of uh, uh, working out uh, uh, about us. Uh, the point is uh, technology is, is something from time immemorial uh, when they found Flintstones and then they found the wheel and then the printing press, all are nothing but you know a technological juggernaut at different points of time. And so we are now into including this chat GPT. So the question is, uh, how, how do we uh, how do we work with technology about uh, not losing the goals of equity, social justice, and many things? So this beginning of the lecture today uh, will be, I'm sure that uh, the coalition between HNLU and you know IT for Change soon as we launch, and I'm pretty sure to have Mr. Paminda in the campus, you know, to for a uh, uh, for a more interactive discussion. So I would like to, from my side, thank him for accepting a little rather short notice, but a topic very dear to the work. What is he doing? So I was pretty sure when uh, Amitesh told me, I said I can only think of for me that, and I'm pretty sure he will accept it. I said, and it happens so. so thank you, Mr. Parminder. Thank you, Vivekanand, and great pleasure. Uh, again, as you will say, the use the right term tapestry because it's a huge area. And you just to have to even start looking in that direction uh, is important. And I think good that you are taking an initiative of technology and society, uh, or some kind of a center or whatever you're trying to set up, and look forward to, uh, to its outputs. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. With this, we conclude the XRK lecture on digital age context of social justice. Once again, I, on behalf of Hidayatullah National Law University, thank Shri Parminder Jeet Singh, sir, for giving, his, for giving us his valuable time. I would like to thank Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and Registrar, sir, for their guidance, and Anita Singh, ma'am, for her support throughout. I would also like to thank all my colleagues, students, and attendees of the event for engaging in a meaningful discourse with us. Hoping to see you all in future XR events. With your permission, sir, I would like to close today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.